Okay, good morning and welcome back to episode 11 of the Bayou Dragons podcast. I'm your host this morning. It'll be our uh, first episode without Porter and Mitchell. You've got your boy Matthew and a familiar face alongside me is Andrew Austin. Yeah, great to be here. And uh, we've got an interesting guest on this morning, a, uh, a native from Arizona who is just a man... I haven't quite got this guy down yet. He's a, he's a stalking fool, and he's a bull riding son of a bitch. Mr. Brandon Reynolds, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, guys. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be out in Texas. It's a little humid for my likings, but uh, getting to meet cool people, see a bunch of happy faces. No complaints on a Sunday morning. No complaints. Glad to hear it, man. Uh, so how much time have you got to spend in Texas aside from uh, – you know, just being down here doing these expos. You know, when I was really young, I came over here and uh, I did a little bit of hunting. You know, I killed my killed my first whitetail buck when I when I was about five years old over here. I was, I was a spoiled kid. I had some really great uncles. Um, did some hog hunting and then back to Arizona. I went and did a lot of a lot of Arizona spot and stock western hunting. And uh, now my Texas experiences are just seeing friends and being here on business at these shows and and some rodeoing. But but I haven't got to hunt a whole lot. Haven't got to see uh, every inch of Texas, so I'd, okay. I'd love to come see you guys in the marsh, man. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Glad that uh, up to this point you've had positive experiences, man. I think uh, I think once we get to that new landscape for you, you're going to have a good time down there as well. Um, but I was really excited to um, to get to have you on this podcast this morning, man. We, uh, we met last weekend in Houston. We were doing the Texas Trophy Hunters down there, and we talked about that on the last episode. Um, so got to meet some really great people, and you know, I got to talk about a lot of them on the last episode, and now here we are getting to kind of put it together and, and present it and make that happen. Um, you know, I I felt like I was talking to Andrew last night. We had this really great conversation at the hotel bar, just sitting there bullshitting and, and cutting up, and I was like, man, we got to save some of this for the podcast. So we cut it short last night. But, um, so, yeah, basically, man, I just I kind of want to, like, pick your brain on a few things, man. Like, the way that you guys hunt up there is completely foreign to the way that, you know, the opportunities that we have in our area in Texas and man, it's just, it's just super cool, man. So tell us what you do with, with diamond outfitters is who you're out here represent. Right. So I am, I'm a, I'm a lead guide with diamond outfitters. Um, me and about 42 other guides are employed with the company. Uh, there's 10 to 15 full-time salary guides. And when I say lead guide, so I show up to a camp and, and some of the younger guys, uh, I'll be in control of them. Um, and oftentimes we're, we're out by ourselves, but that's just kind of the, the job title that I have. And I'm taking, uh, taking clients on deer, elk, antelope, and sheep, and, and any other big game hunts in Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, we do some in southwestern Colorado and Sonora, Mexico. Sonora, Mexico. So I know we talked briefly about it last night, but like Sonora, that's, that's completely out of the country. So you have to go through and clear customs and or whatever their um, – you know, whatever their form of customs is to cross the border and to go down there and hunt. What's that like? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a pretty simple process, especially if you got a guy that speaks good, good Espanol. Uh, I'm not that guy, so so I sit around and listen a lot of times. But the the U.S. side, it's really easy getting into Mexico. I mean, you and I could drive down there with a with a that trailer right there in front of us right now, and and nobody would really stop us. When we get to the Mexico side, though, that's what that's when we have to start. We we have to stop in with the uh, the Mexico National Guard, and there's a whole lot of loud Spanish speaking and guys with AK-47s, and and there might be like a Barrett 50 mounted on top of a Toyota pickup truck with a roll cage uh, pointed at you. A lot of times, you hope those boys got to save trigger fingers anyhow. And it it only takes about five minutes, so everything everything's really smooth. They love to have us down there, and, and they they check us all out as long as we get our paperwork in order. Uh, they check the rifles, and, and El Jefe comes and signs us off and sends us on our way out into uh, the, the large Sonoran Desert down there. I guess that, that side of Mexico is, is really just big and wide open. Do you think people, though, like, is Mexico, I guess maybe not in that area, but there's, you know, places in Mexico you probably wouldn't want to go. You know, you worry about, like, the, the cartel presence. Have you ever experienced anything like that? You know, we've been pretty lucky. We, we try not to do business down there where, where it's bad. Um, I'd be lying to you if if we're not if I told you we're not around it. You know, it's a it's very predominantly cartel run. I'm, they're they're in charge down there. They they run the police. They they run the they run the ranchers rampant. The only thing they don't run and and, uh, and it's a good thing because we see a lot of presence of it on the roadways is the is the national guard, which uh, 
they kind of did away with the federal rallies down there and the, and the Mexican National Guard. If you see them on the road, man, you feel pretty safe because those are the good guys. They're uh, they're fighting the war on it just like just like we are here in the states. Yeah, something I noticed when I was down there uh, not too long ago was I saw a lot of like uh, militant type, um, you know, I guess Mexican military force and. You know, more often than I would see, like, the police, I'd see a lot of uh, military presence down there. And so I guess they're kind of taking over in that in that regard. Um, but that's really cool, man. Uh, just just so many new things and exciting things that uh, myself and Andrew haven't got to experience, man. Uh, yeah. Andrew, what yeah, do you man, think about uh, it this morning? You've been <coughs> pretty quiet over there. Yeah, I've been quiet. Uh, I asked all the good questions last night, you know. I just – Hunting Arizona is a lot different than Texas. Y'all got a lot of public land. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, it's Predominantly have, public land. And y'all have just great wildlife resources, cool cool habitats, and you're talking about hunting the ponderosa pines up in the Sky Islands up there and sure. the desert, and uh, all that's really cool to hear about. Uh, but we're, we're talking about Sonora. Uh, what's the landscape like there? Man, it, it's, it's really, really desolate desert. Um, there's not a whole lot of water around until you talk to some of the locals and, and they go, what do you mean? Look at all that water. And, and, and they're talking about the cactus, like, okay. like the deer and the sheep and things like that. They, they live off that cactus. They don't, they'll go years without drinking. Yeah. Just, they're just getting it all from their food. Uh, and, and it kind of, you got to change your eye looking at it because there is a lot of water in the desert. It's just not in liquid form. Yeah. Right. Not in plain sight. Right. One thing that stuck out last night was our uh, conversation about jaguars in, in northern Mexico and and down into uh, into Arizona too. Absolutely. And you're saying there's a lot more jaguars than than what most people think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's usually like adolescent males. Um, they're they're going to come up and they're going to check out a couple different mountain ranges. Even where I live near Tucson, Arizona, it uh, we, we get jags caught in there every every now and then. We'll catch them on camera. And they work these big circles. And then as you get farther down into Sonora, some of the properties that we work on, we have Jags a- actively on them. Uh, we see the tracks. We talk to the local cowboys and stuff, and they'll talk about hearing them roar, and they've got some pictures. So a matter of time, I'm, I'm going to have some trail cameras down there in Mexico. I'm going to get my own picture. Yeah. Now, does that, that add to the experience for you when you're out hunting and stuff, just knowing there's Jags around? It's, it's cool, yeah. right? It's a cool a- feeling. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's a great feeling. It's, it's not something so much in Arizona. Like, you get up in northern Arizona, you don't feel like there's a Jag there. And southern Arizona, like, you might have some lions and bobs. And, and maybe an ocelot or two, but but you don't think about it like that. And then when you get down into like some of this subtropical Sonoran desert where where the jags are, are very active, it's a different feeling walking around down there, knowing like that's the king of the jungle, man. That's mm-hmm. that's it's cool stuff. Yeah, I've been uh, I've done some research down in Belize, and we were camping out there, and and there were jags seen nearby, and just n- the presence you can feel it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> you know? kind of. Make the hair on the back of your neck yeah. stand up. It's it's a really cool feeling. Yeah. So for those of our listeners down and around, you know, uh, central United States and like in our area, I just learned this last night that I didn't realize how much diversity they had ecosystem wise out towards uh, the west of us, you know, in Arizona and in New Mexico and places like that. So, I mean, just the way that it was publicized to me, like all my life, having never been out there, it's just like desert and that's it. Yeah, but it's there's it's so much more diverse than that. I mean, you got everything from what was it that you were uh, Sky the, Islands, the Sky Islands. Yeah. So d- run run through what what is that? What is that ecosystem like? The Sky Islands. So the Sky Islands. Um, I live about two thousand foot elevation in like potato dirt farm country, and and all around me there's there's these mountains. Um, some of them bigger than others. Uh, the Santa Catalina Mountain Range, which is just above Tucson, Arizona. A uh, lot of lot of Mount, or uh, not mountain bikers, but like Olympic bikers like to come ride these roads because you can go from 2,000 foot elevation in Tucson where it's 110 degrees and, and hot and, and in like an 18, 20 mile drive, you can be upwards of 8,000 feet where, they're, where the air is thin and, and there's pine trees and it's 40 degrees cooler, a lot of bears and stuff up there. Uh, just right above Tucson, Arizona, where people think about the, the university and, and the Saguaro National Park and kind of the, the whole desert face of of Arizona. It's what people think about. But the Sky Islands, are they're, it's a crazy habitat where you see things that uh, that you wouldn't think when when you think Arizona. Yeah. And they are literal islands of, of oh, habitat. Yeah. They're just the elevation change and, and the surrounding area is just desert. And then you get up there and it's a t- totally different world up there, plants so, and animals. So the, calling it an island, is it is it just that it's it's essentially like in and of itself just like a, a set little bitty set place like 
Yeah, yeah. Most of the ranges are, are secluded um, with miles between each other, but but the ranges are big. I, I think the reason they get the Sky Island name is, is the such fast elevation change because you go from desert floor to to pine trees and in in very very rapid time yeah, yeah. And now what do you, what are you hunting up in the sky islands exactly um mostly coos deer uh coos deer like like the higher elevation a lot of you, a lot of your mule deer are going to stay in the lower country um and coos deer I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them at all it's uh they're a subspecies of whitetail and a big buck might weigh 90 to 110 pounds and, and a, a a true giant trophy deer is going to be 120 inches. That's 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 like as big as they come. They get bigger, but wait, you're not passing on many 100 inch deer in, in public land Arizona. Because if you do, he's a uh, he's going to disappear to somebody else's wall. You know. It's so basically, it's a subspecies that is uh, that really w- adapted to that different you know habitat, the high elevation stuff, smaller, more maneuverable. Absolutely, that different terrain than you know. They're very agile deer. They're li- they're little deer, man. They're they're it's like a yellow Labrador running around the mountains with with antlers and a in a white tail. Um, they they got a nickname called the gray ghost. Uh, we do a lot of spot and stock glassing for them, you know, spot and stock style hunting. And, and you could be watching a coos deer, and he's standing there, and and you you might blink your eyes, and you're like, where'd he go? And you watch for a little bit more, and he never moved. He, they just blend in with their terrain so well. Um, they're such a fun animal to hunt, and nobody from Texas really likes them. I've, I've, I've been here for two weeks selling hunts and, and getting to chat with people, and nobody's interested in coos deer. But if you come out and hunt something like that one time, it, it's not the same as a Texas whitetail. They're totally different, kind of get under your skin, and it's a lot of fun. They're, they're a neat animal. Yeah, yeah I, I think that could partly be due to the fact that you know, the type of people that we attract into here to come and buy hunts, they want to go big. They want to go as big as possible. They sure. want to do the big elk hunts, draw the big mule deer tags and stuff like that. I mean, what do you think? You think that's been a trend in, in uh, like, expos and stuff like this? Yeah, absolutely. And in Texas, like, there's Texas whitetails around this place that, that blow my mind. So I think the whole whitetail thing, Texas guys thinks, thinks of a 90-inch whitetail buck, and that's, that's, a, that's a management deal. That's a coal buck. It, it's not interesting to those guys. What's what's been big here in Texas is is like elk hunting. Guys guys want to come out west and and try something that maybe they haven't tried. Um, a lot of lot of interest in big mule deer too because I know there is big mule deer in Texas, but there there's not not a lot. Um, black bears and mountain lions too. That's that's another thing. Texans want to come come chase some lions and and bears, either spot and stock bears or or we run them with hounds, both of them as well. So. That that's showed a lot of interest this this week, and it's it's really fun to talk to people about because they they don't quite understand that Arizona has has a very very large black bear population, and and we're about over overran with mountain lions. Yeah, cool deal. Now, is the the hunting culture in general a lot different in Arizona? I don't know anything about hunting in Arizona until I met you. You know. It's yeah, um, I'd I'd say it's a lot different. Uh, we. Uh, we do uh, spot and stock style hunting. Not many guys still hunt. Um, when you do, it's usually in over a water hole uh, or or a salt, and and you might you might hike a blind in. But we're we're just like in the mornings we wake up and and we go sit on a hillside and we glass for that animal. We we're gonna see a lot a lot of critters, but. Yeah. When we find one that we want, we're, we're then going to make a plan and we're going to stalk him. And it might take might take all day for one opportunity. Right. That's cool, man. Um, you know, here in Texas, it's it's a lot different. Um, we have so much private land; we can't just go out into a big, vast wilderness and go hike and spot and stalk. And uh, so most people grow up deer hunting, you know, on a feeder, you know, in a blind, sitting there, and that's just a totally different experience, you know. And uh, you know, going out there in the wild is, is much more attractive to me. The thought of that is just badass, man. Like oh, what you yeah. do, I, I want I want to go out there so bad, <laughs> dude. I was um, so I was like running that down. I was like, man, like we could have. Uh, it's just so crazy the kind of opportunities that we have now. Um, you know, thanks to us getting out there. You know, getting out there, getting out of our comfort zone, and and getting to meet new people and make new co- new connections, new friends, and and network in that regard. And like, I was like, I would have never thought I would have had the opportunity to, to talk to somebody about maybe making that happen, you know, going out there and spotting and stalking a, an animal like that. It's just, yeah. it's so far fetched coming from, you know, the area that we're in, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Before I forget, tell us the, the, the mountain lion story again. 
Oh yeah, so gotta hear that again. These guys were asking me last night if I if I'd ever killed a mountain lion, and and I have I have one under my belt, and I've I've got to experience quite a few lion kills and and see lots of lions in the wild, but this one particular lion that I harvested was uh, with my muzzleloader, and I was deer hunting with my with my dad on an early season Southern Arizona coos deer tag, and. First thing in the morning, a, a lion comes over the hill, and I have, I've got a lion tag in my pocket. For, for an Arizona resident, it's only $15. I, I want to say a non-resident tag costs 75 So if you're going to be running around the, the desert area and, and you have any interest in killing a lion, you want to have a tag in your pocket. It's relatively cheap, and it, it's well worth it, trust me. Uh, so I glass up this lion, and, and the unit's open, and I sure as heck like to shoot it but uh i have my muzzle loader and i'm only good out to about 300 yards with the muzzle loader and and the cat's six seven hundred yards so not a not too much of a poke with a with a long range rifle but with a muzzle loader not going to happen and I, I leave my dad on the on the mountain side up above me to kind of kind of watch over things he's the spotter and i put a stock on this cat and uh I get an opportunity at her about 350 yards when, when she's moving across a rock bluff, and I, I let her have one. I, well, so I thought. Uh, smoke goes off in front of me. I have no idea what happened, and, and I see the cat kind of work across this bluff. She goes about 15, 20 yards, and then she, she bails off about a 10, 15-foot bluff and, and lands in the brush below. And we've, I've got this whole mountainside pinned. I mean, she couldn't go any way without me seeing her. So I, I waited out for a little bit, reload my muzzleloader, and, you know, half hour goes by. I, I talk to my dad, and he, he tells me that, that I'd shot just underneath her. Um, sorry, you know, and I'm, I'm upset at this point, but I was pretty confident in my shot, man, and the lion never came out. And my dad's like, man, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. She, she got away. But I, I just couldn't, I couldn't stomach that. I, I had to go over there. Um, I, I, I was looking for blood, half expecting to find a dead lion, maybe half expecting to spook her out of there um and i'm walking across the, the the bluff that she was on and i get to the spot where she jumped off and it was a real you uh, you just knew the spot it kind of had a strange rock formation and i get right there to the edge and you know at this point I'm, I'm pretty frustrated i'm looking out away from me you know 20 30 out to like 400 yards expecting to see a cat maybe run out, out, out of there out, right yeah. like maybe get a chip shot try it again kind of deal and I hear the most subtle, like, and, and I look at my feet right tucked up against the, against the bluff that she bailed off of in, in some thick mesquite brush. Uh, she's standing there looking up at me, baring her teeth. And I just, it, it just reaction, you know, I just, no, no sweat about it, put, put it right between her shoulder blades and, and let her have a 50 caliber muzzleloader so I, I killed her instantly. And now I've got a, got a really big female lion on my wall. And that's that's awesome. got to be just the ultimate experience out there in the oh, desert. That is a, as primal as it gets, man. Primal yeah. as they come right there. Primal man. shit right there. Golly. Man. In Texas, you're not going to have that opportunity, probably ever, because we're, sure. we're not like Arizona. We're, we're fragmented, and we don't have those big lines on the, most of the landscape now. Right. I had heard back at a certain point when we were spending a lot of time in Lando that they were seeing a lot of cats out there. Yeah, yeah we'd get out to West Texas. They're, they're popping up. But in East Texas, where we, where we grew up, you know, it's – there's no big predators on the landscape oh, you anymore. You wouldn't so really hear about just, something like that yeah. in our area. No, yeah, for black sure. bears are gone, mountain lions, everything. Oh, we got plenty of them. <laughs> they, it, people don't see them, and people don't think about lions. Um, that's because lions don't want to be seen. They they usually say like if you spend some spend some serious time off of a main road hiking around, you might not see a lion, but a lion saw you. Right. Like, like we've got a lot of them. Yeah. It's awesome, always man. being watched out there, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Whether it's by a uh, federales or the cartel, or maybe a sure. big cat's got his eyes yeah, on you, boy. Big old jag, man, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's pretty. Uh, what, so um, we talked a little bit about having you come down and do some, maybe do some teal hunting and some waterfowl. You mentioned that you guys get to do a little bit of waterfowl hunting up in your area. Oh yeah. Um, so I mean, what what excites you about coming down to Texas and getting to see what we have to offer? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm a duck hunting fool. Yeah. I, that's, that's, that was my youth. That was the, what me and my brothers did. My, my good buddy Hunter, we, we always just ran around and we shot ducks. But it's a, it's a little bit different style where I come from and on these big, vast desert cattle ranches. Uh, we're, we're sneaking up on, on stock tanks and, and we're pond jumping them, you know. Um, 
and ducks are smart. They they got good eyes and good ears. So mm-hmm. so we practiced a whole lot of stalking on, on on ponds, and we we try to kill a lot of ducks every year. It coincides with the archery deer season. So we're we're in the mornings. We're running around with our bows, chasing mule deer bucks and coos deer bucks. And then as the hunting slows down, we grab the shotguns and we we we'll drive we'll drive 150 miles if we have to on dirt roads, just hitting circuits of stock tanks. Um, so that's my duck hunting experience. It's pretty much all I've ever done. I've, I've got to be in a layout blind one or two times, and it's just totally foreign to me. And then I get to see you guys hunting the marsh country and all this uh, stacking piles of teals and mallards, and you guys get some wood ducks. That makes me jealous. Like, I have never got to really sit over decoys and, and shoot a limit of birds. And you guys got that down pat, it seems. Yeah, yeah it's well, a, we, we have quite a bit of diversity down where we're at, you know. Uh, it's, it's hard. It's easy to say sometimes, like, I think we're spoiled as waterfowlers. I really think we are because we've had, at the time we came into it and, you know, started learning the game and getting it down pat, like you said, we were having some pretty, really successful seasons and we were able to make it happen, you know, pretty often. Um, but I, I th- I'd probably dedicate that and say that that was because of the time we had to put forth into it. You know, we are in high school. And when you're not in school, what are you going to do? You know, Man, we spend all of our time hunting and fishing. That best was time it. of my life right yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> so we, we spend a lot of time patterning, you know, where to go out and have the best success killing birds in the marsh. And, you know, it's since gotten a little bit more difficult with got a lot of traffic, a lot of guys going out there. It's getting more and more um, almost feels like a like waterfowl hunting is getting to a point where it's popular. It's like a status thing, you know, to go out there and, and just kill as many birds as possible. And I hate that in the sense that, I feel like people are losing sight of the, the hunting aspect of it. You know, I know a ton of people that don't even like eating waterfowl at all. They hate it. They mm. go out there and they'll shoot a four man limit of ducks and they don't, they don't care. They're after, they they're after a pile pick for yeah. Instagram. They're yeah. after that, that's that tough. photo that they can take yeah. and then they can, you know, they, they don't care where the birds go at all. They, they just don't know how to cook it, man. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the ducks, problem. Man. Yeah, I love I eating love ducks. ducks. I've never had a bad one. What yeah, species think, uh, of ducks do y'all shoot out in Arizona? Um, we shoot a lot of mallards, a, a lot of widgeon and gadwalls. Uh, I've killed one wood duck my whole life, so that the was the coveted cinnamon teal out there. Um, yeah, yeah. Every now and then, um, I've killed blue wing cinnamon and green heads in Arizona. Um, a lot, a lot of green wing teal. Uh, trying to think of what else. Uh, we we get we get some pintails on occasion. They're they're getting more and more rare. Uh, I actually caught I, I killed some pintails with my nephew uh, last winter, and and I've got a pair at the taxidermy for myself, and and we're getting him a him a nice big drake with a big old big old sprig on him so i'll tell you this i, <clears throat> I plan on on uh, hunt duck hunt in west texas this year i might slip on over to arizona and go duck hunt with you out there that'd yeah, be man i want to duck hunt in like every region and habitat every biome in north america sure. some, you know throughout my because it's so cool man there's all different types of ducks different areas they like and just being in the desert shooting ducks just sounds really cool to me <laughs> it, it, yeah. it is cool crawling through choya cactus man, <laughs> yeah. uh, man cool, so man. so what's what's like the worst cactus you want to avoid out there so oh. I could see me going out there first day and just getting tore up by something. Man, there's a there's a lot of prickly pear in places that we hunt, and that's pretty easy. A guy can navigate it without really getting himself stuck up too bad. You might get some shin diggers every now and then, but choya is the worst. So choya, these these big choya cactuses, man, if you barely brush that, they'll stick to you. Yeah, you're yeah. Getting, it's falling off the cactus. It's sticking in you. If you, if you don't get it out in one fell swoop, it's gonna roll over and keep mm-hmm. sticking in you. Choya is my my least favorite to deal with. Yeah, I've, I've had some. We have something similar. What is it like up in Central Texas? Man, we got we got all sorts of pricklies out there. Yeah, I, but I, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't know the the exact name of it, but something similar. But they're very small. Uh, they they leave a, a little bitty uh, probe on you, almost. You know, that's just like a little drop, a little satellite on you. You carry it around and whatever. But um, man, I had a bad run in with uh, what the natives called a tassahia down there in South Texas. I bailed off in there after a pig one time, dude, and it was just extremely fibrous all over my whole body. It felt like I rolled around in fiberglass, man. It was not good. That's the worst. I, I picked up this hog and drug him out, and he was just ate up with it. You know, he was covered in it and no T-shirt. Just, oh, couldn't, I couldn't move in bed that night. I just had to lay exactly <laughs> precisely still or else I was just, there was just needles going in my body, man. But, yeah, that sucks. But, oh, dude, I mean, I don't know. It's, just, it's really cool and exciting stuff, man. Um Wish we could be sitting here over a cold beer right now, like we were doing last night. Uh, could have had the mics on that. It was a good time. Um, we're here with the coffee this morning, and a uh, uh, good hangover brought to you by Coors Light. So um, <laughs> appreciate y'all for that. And um, but yeah, man, I'm I'm really happy we we're able to make this happen. 
It's uh, been fun. Uh, this ca- this podcast is uh, fueled by caffeine and nicotine. Caffeine man. and <laughs> nicotine, it's, man. It's a rough morning. Yeah, long, dude. A couple of long nights, last couple of nights, but a little bit of coffee, a little bit of Copenhagen. Hey, long nights, but they're good nights. Yes, sir. Uh, man, I always love it whenever I was – I just knew that, you know, getting you and Andrew together – I was like, this is the perfect idea for me to host this podcast because I won't even have to say anything. You guys are, are really, uh, <laughs> really well educated in, in, you know, both of your your fields and what you decide to dedicate your time to. Um, but I think um, I think there's something to be said about that too. You know, whenever whether or not it's you know Arizona desert or Southeast Texas, Upper Texas coast, and the marsh down there, I think it's important that you master your environment wherever you're at, whether and that whether that's at work or at home or with whatever you do, you want to be the best at that. Sure. And if you're passionate about, you know, spot and stalk hunting or tracking, you know, coos deer across uh, the Sky Islands in Arizona, you know, whatever it is, be the best at it. Yep. And, you know, and so I think, um, you know, that that's similar to why we, you know, the, the time that we've dedicated into our waterfowl hunting has, has been, you know, us mastering our environment. And so it's exciting to know that, you know, you'll have the opportunity to come down with us sometime and we'll get to show you, you know, like, hey. Here's what we got to do. Here's the best way to do it, man. Like, you know, show things. you the business yeah. end of, of, of what we do. And, and I'm also really excited to, uh, man, I wanted to pick your brain about some of that stuff. So if you were going to take, um, say you're taking a customer out, right, um, what's, like the, what's like an ideal hunt for you that is, is really, you know, is, is customer friendly, I'd say? Um, definitely, I would definitely go right back to coos deer. They're, they're, they're pretty easy to draw. Um, guy, guy can hunt one probably every two years if he wanted to on a pretty fun hunt. You can hunt those sky islands, get to see a lot of, a lot of flora and fauna that, that a guy doesn't ever get to see. So I like to have like, it's almost school time when a client shows up to camp and he's never been out there because it helps me tell him where animals are at. So, so we'll drive around and, and we'll be like, what's that called? And, and, and I'll quiz these guys. Like, I've taught them up once, and I'm, I'm talking about mesquite and choya and palo verde and ocotillas and prickly pears and barrel cactuses. And we'll drive through and school these guys up. They get to learn a whole lot, and we get to look at a whole lot of deer. Kind of, it's, it's the perfect hunt to learn about, like, the spot and stock out west hunting. All right. Well, 10-4, man. Uh, Golly, I wish I could just stretch this episode out all day. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't, man. Gotta close uh, it out here. So we have an exciting two-parter for you guys today. Uh, Mitchell's going to get on. We have another guest. I'll let him introduce you guys to them. Uh, but we want to thank everybody for stopping in with us, man. Uh, it's been Matt, Andrew, and Mr. Brandon Reynolds here. Hey, man, we really appreciate you sitting down and, you and talking thank with us on this me. podcast, man. We're gonna glad we uh, glad we got to to build this friendship, man, and, and get to meet each other. So. Yeah, this yeah. ain't the last one. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be some exciting You're going to come on to my go. podcast hey, at some man, point. I, I'll pick your I'd brain for three to, hours. Yeah, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to do that. Do it over a couple beers, and it uh, yeah. won't be the last you'll see of me. I hope it's the same way. Oh, yeah. Cool yeah deal, maybe man. next time we'll, we'll be doing this podcast, you know, later than 9 o'clock in the morning, maybe yeah. 9 o'clock at night yeah. with, uh, you know, with a cold beer in the hand. So. Yeah, appreciate it. The man. words right, will yeah. flow better that way. Yeah, <laughs> dude, for sure. Well, hey, thanks for stopping by, man. What's going on, guys? This is going to be part two of episode 11. Uh, we're at the Texas Trophy Hunters um, Extravaganza in Dallas, Texas. And we had a pretty cool guest on the first part. I was walking around the other day, and I met this guy named Rick. He is a waterfowl guide from West Texas. And we got to talking and kind of hit it off. And I said, hey, man, why don't you come on the podcast? We'll uh, sit on there and bullshit a little bit, and you can tell me uh, a little bit about what you do. So, Rick, man, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, know a little background of what you do up there in West Texas. Yeah, so I'm a, my name's Ricky Jessup. I'm 21 years old. Uh, from South Louisiana. Um, got into the guiding out there, and I used to guide for a guy, and um, it's called Gaydon, Southwest Louisiana rice fields, a bunch of teal and everything. And uh, I got with him, and he, you know, he let me guide not for money for hunts so i would take people out and if i wanted to hunt or i had two buddies with me he'd say hey you take this group of 10 and you bring your couple buddies and y'all go hunting so i started off there and then man i went to school played baseball in school and school for me was miserable so my buddy gets on west texas and he sends me these videos of sandhill cranes and i'm like man i gotta do that right so i text him i drop out of school <laughs> hate to say it and uh, I text him. I'm like, hey, man, get me a job. He said, all right, come on. He said, when can you be here? He said, he said be here in two weeks. And he wanted me there at the beginning of November. And he ended up calling me like two days after he told me to be there in two weeks. And he said, come tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. 
Like, loaded my truck up, loaded my dog up. Just shag left, ass. Just, I told my mom I loved her and <laughs> rolled out. I mean, you know, because that's uh, – I love it. Uh, but, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Uh, that's how I got into it, I would say. And right now, man, that's all I want to do is hunt. So you dropped out of college to be a waterfowl guide. Yeah, I did. I, You know, I mean, I was going to baseball practice at 4 in the morning with my boat behind my truck. And luckily where I played, I played in a pretty low, you know, 30 minutes from my house. So I knew all the marsh and everything around me. And one of our – it was a more like a, like a redhead hole. I mean, you go in there and you shoot your redheads and then you shoot a bunch of canvas backs, you know, a bunch of drakes and everything. You'd go out there and kind of trophy hunt. And it was fun. And it was behind my school. So I would, you know, do my workout 6 in the morning. I'd – you know, get done and go hunt. So how many years have you been guiding now up there? This is my second year in Texas. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, four years total. The first two years I wasn't getting paid for it. I was hunting, you know, making – I was taking people just to be able to hunt some land. Right. So as you, you know, guide more and more and get more experience, you know, hunting with big groups of people, you can kind of talk about that, you know, managing those people and – you know, do you have to, like, sit them down before the hunt and be like, okay, man, this is how we're going to do it, you know, talk about safety, yeah. talk about everything, how you're going to call the shots. And, I mean, do you ever have anybody, like, jump early and try to shoot or anything? Man, so a really good example of this, my first group I ever did was 15 hunters. And, I mean, you know, my dog's never retrieved a crane. Um, just put the goggles on him and – I get this group of hunters out there, and they weren't real big in the waterfowl hunting. A couple of guys were. So what I did was I, I was trying to use the guys who knew what they were doing to my advantage and put them, you know, maybe every two people you'd have one person who knew what they were doing so he could look over too and be like, hey, man, you know, your gun's off safety. Because 15 people, you know, I was sitting in the middle, and uh, you can't really – you try to keep track of everybody, man, but it's hard. And uh, so – that hunt we had guns falling over you know one dude popped up ruined a group of 20 cranes coming in to kill one bird and he didn't even kill it so what i do in the mornings you know that was like my the first hunt i had was probably the worst one not bird wise but with people and trying to figure out and i wasn't super big on you know like i hadn't really had talks with people well after that hunt i uh now i you know set our decoys up and kind of let them set out the blind, introduce myself to them in case, you know, because a lot of guys drive in and tell them, you know, uh, guns on safety. We have these little things. It's like a little piece you put on the thing. Your gun goes in this little gun holder. Don't take it off safety. Don't touch your gun until we're about to shoot. I mean, because you'll get those guys. They just want to sit there with their gun. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've had guns go off. We've had blinds get shot. I mean, it's like, you know, stuff that a lot of people don't want to talk about. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Really, I guess, as a guide, you know, you just think, oh, this guy knows how to kill birds. But you got to be good with people, I would imagine. You know, when you get those groups of, you know, nine, you know, ten-plus people, you got to be able to talk to people and, you know, explain gun safety, explain how everything's going to work and call the shots accordingly and all that stuff. Yeah, it uh, it gets pretty rough. I mean, you know, like dealing with all those guns. So one of my biggest things when I was back home was when I hunted when I was young, my dad's got buddies who – you know, they'd see us killing birds, and his buddies would text him and be like, hey, you think Ricky can take these guys, you know, shoot some mallards? And I'd tell my dad, I ain't hunting with nobody else. I had my group, it was about eight to ten people that I felt comfortable with, and I used to tell my dad, I'm not taking any of your buddy sons, you know. Just more of a, uh, I want to be familiar with who I'm around, who I'm in the boat with, who the who's shooting by me, you know, who's shooting, you know, when my dog's out there, we need to shoot a cripple. All my buddies, I feel comfortable that they will not ever put my dog in that thing. So, you know, you get people who you don't know, and, I mean, you don't know what they're going to do, if how much experience. I could say I've been hunting for 100 years, but how do you know that? Right. And, uh, but, yeah, once I started guiding, my dad's like, man, remember all them times you wouldn't take my buddy's kids? <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, now you're hunting. That's what, like, you're taking random people hunting. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, tell tell me tell us about the cranes, man. Because you, you grew up waterfowl hunting, and, and you know ducks and geese are they're pretty distant to cranes. That's a whole nother beast, you know. And they're smart, right? They're oh smart, man, right? they're just a weary bird. They're awesome. I mean, they're I've shot ducks and geese my whole life. Well, I got to here's the funny thing is when I my first sandhill crane hunt, I had learned how to call them and everything, which you really don't call to them. Sometimes you might need to give them a little something, but 
they're really vocal birds. And, uh, man, my first time, I had never even shot a crane. I mean. And you're guiding a group of people I'm on a sandhill crane. Fifteen dudes, and we smashed them. Yeah. I mean, shout out to my boss. He stays on it. He, I mean, he just, you know, while we're hunting, he's scouting. He makes his round every day, and we got, I couldn't even estimate you know how many fields we have and he checks those fields every day and tells you hey this field's got you know 10,000 birds this field's got 20 birds you know so then I'll drive over there in the evening and check out you know this is where I need to put the blind this is what we need to do wind's going to do this tomorrow you know this hill's a little bit higher so they might put your decoys on there and man but them cranes they're vocal they're loud I mean you'll be setting up and you if you're close enough to the roost you'll just hear them just yeah. No, you can hear them when they're oh, when they're migrating, you know, oh. way up in the sky. That's the first thing I hear when when the birds start migrating in the yeah. fall. You hear them cranes way up there, and you can hear them. They're so loud, man. So when when you're crane hunting, there's a lot of lot of scouting involved. I would imagine tons of it. You know, cranes. Like I wouldn't say you you know you can traffic ducks and you can traffic geese, but cranes, from my experience, I just don't think they're they're going to go where they want to go. If they don't like something, they're gone. I mean. They're probably the the hardest hardest and the easiest birds. If you're on them and you got your decoys right, they're going to do it right. And, I mean, shooting them, it's a giant bird. I put it on their beak. That's what I tell everybody. Put it on the beak. If you shoot behind them, you shoot them in the body. They're, you know, four foot long. But, uh, man, they are just – I would skip mallards in the timber. I'd skip marsh, pintail, like anything you could offer me, I would skip four cranes. Oh, shit, man, that is – that's interesting. Um, y'all use like full body decoys and a lot of them, or is it is it so decoy it, like it um it differs. You know, we we run dive bomb silhouettes and we run SX full bodies. And uh, last year I didn't touch the silhouettes just because we had it, last year was kind of a rough year. Man, we didn't have any juvenile birds, so it was just hard. And uh, but we ran all full bodies. And some days I was running you know two three dozen crane decoys, and some days I was running. At the end, I remember our last hunt we made, we did like a little guide hunt. Last day evening, went out there, 2 o'clock, set our decoys up, didn't see birds for like, I mean, three hours. And we ran every decoy we had. Well, I don't know, 20 minutes before shooting light was up, we just heard them coming. And they just piled in. But that hunt there, I mean, we were on them, but we needed all those decoys. I mean, I could, that hunt we probably had. 18 dozen decoys, I guess. Yeah. So typically on the crane, is it a later flight than, you know, you know, ducks or – because ducks usually you, sh- you kill them early. In yeah. In our experience, you know, we shoot pretty early. And, um, you know, geese sometimes a little later flight. Is it more like a later flight? or? Man, from my experience, I would say that they're, they're not your early birds, you know. Uh, I think we killed one last year that was like – he came in, I mean, super early, in the dark pretty much, shooting light. But – it was dark, and uh, but I would say they're more like geese, you know, kind of later, later birds. Right. So you you talked about you have a retriever. You pretty proud of that dog? I mean, he does good for you. Man, I love that dog. He uh, he's a beast. I got so lucky with him. He was given to me by a guy named Brian Frierson. He owns Riverside Retrievers, and man, that dog. I mean. I lost two birds last year, and the only two birds – I'm not talking about ducks, just cranes. I lost two cranes last year, and uh, it was because I didn't have them with me. That was it. I mean, I can't run like him. I've tried running cranes down, and luckily he'll bring me a bird, and I'll be like, you know, back, send him off. He went on a uh, 1.7-mile retrieve in Venice, Louisiana one time. Jesus. And when he did that, dude, we were drinking or whatever. We'd go out, we hunt, and – Snow goose, we worked as snow goose, and out there you hunt big water, and they have mud flats when the tide goes out. Kind of like, y'all, you know, y'all probably know exactly what I'm talking about, but them snow geese, they like to be out on them as mud flats. Well, this snow comes in, and, man, he was like 70, 80 yards out there. And I was like, y'all try him. I mean, we got eight guns. And we just clipped him, and he just glided down. And a kid who, my really good buddy, he uh, wasn't in a duck hunt. I mean, this is like his first time duck hunting. He goes, your dog won't get that. And I said, okay. So I took him out there and as a blind retrieve, didn't see the bird fall or anything, and I sent him across his mud flat. Well, they had a little canal, you know. When the water goes out, that mud flat's, you know, a little bit higher than the canal. Well, he ran, 
and then st- I stopped him. I sent him back, and he went under in that canal. And when he did, we got really big alligators out there. I mean, even mm-hmm. in December, January, when he hit that canal, dude, I thought I lost him. I was like, hope, you know, what? I don't know what happened. I'm hoping for the best. So I take off running. And I didn't realize how far of a swim it was. It was probably about 60 yards he had to swim. And, man, when he popped up on that other side, he just – Sat down. I didn't blow a whistle, but he did sit down and look at me because he didn't know where what he where he needed to go. And I sent him back one more time. He went and got that bird, and I got videos of it. I got it marked out on the maps. It's like one point seven total. That's crazy how how good those dogs are, man. I mean, just a good retriever. The things they can do is insane. But uh, talking about alligators, we won't run our uh, dogs early till season and early season too hot, dude. We have too many gators in the marsh to risk it, dude. I mean, just last season, there's gators swimming in our damn yeah. decoys, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we deal with a lot of big alligators, too. Last year, so where we hunt down in Venice, I mean, we really shouldn't hunt dogs until late January. But I'm the kind of guy, my dog, dude, when I load my boat up, he knows what's going on. Right. Yeah. So I took him with me last year, early teal season opener, and we go out there and we get this little pothole. I mean, it couldn't have been but 60 yards across, and – it had it was super shallow, so I said, you know what, I'll send my dog in the decoys, but I'm not going to send him far out there. Mm-hmm. So all the which I say far, 60 yards. I didn't even want him to go to the end of it, you know, where the gator can come out the marsh or something. And uh, we shot a bunch of birds, and I was sending him on the birds, you know, that were 15, 20 yards in front of us. And we hop in the boat, crank it up, and we're going to go around and pick the dead birds up that are around the edges. And when we did, that deep canal was behind us, and we had about an 11 footer sitting there i mean back out the water and everything just sitting behind us i mean he couldn't have been but 30 40 yards behind us staring at us and i was like man he had to have been watching my dog (laughs) so the whole trip we hunted two more days smashed the birds and i kept my dog in the boat he didn't get out the boat and it was just it it sucks yeah we've had gators uh come up swim up and get our birds on the water before we can you know hunting without a dog or whatever they'll come get your birds i mean they're we got a very uh large population of alligators on the coast and if it's over if it's over 70 degrees and maybe even over 60 degrees and sunny they can warm up enough to feed you know oh yeah Um, now these warm days you get in the middle of december and january if it's just warm for two or three days even if it hits 70 or 80 that's usually not enough to get them out of that that brumation period they're in and they're not really going to – they're not a big threat. Even if you see them up basking, you know, late in the winter, it's usually not a big problem, you know, from my angle. Yeah, they you – know. supposedly they – so the dog – the guy I got my dog from, he tells me, you know, he knows all about it. You know, don't hunt your dog until it freezes for a couple of days. And he's texted me a couple of times when he saw I got my dog out there, and he's like, hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that motherfucker back. You know what I'm saying? Like – that's what he ta- he also told me when I first got the dog. He said, "If I ever catch that dog in the back of your truck and not in a kennel, he goes, I will take that dog." Golly. I'll be damned. So, uh, as hunters, as waterfowl hunters, you always hear about how good uh, sandhill crane is to eat. I've never personally hunted sandhill crane. We usually, you know, mainly hunt the coastal marsh, so we can't hunt them in our area. It's more of a breeding ground, off limits to hunt them. So, I mean, how good are they? You always hear how good they are. The ribeye in the sky is what they call them. I've never had a hunter say they didn't like it. I mean, we've cut the breast off the bird, salt and pepper, put it on a hot grill, medium rare. It's steak. I mean, that's that's as simple as that. And I was kind of, you know, like, you're like, this big-ass bird can't taste that good when you look at it. I mean, they're stupid looking, you know. But when you actually eat a sandhill crane right, we fried it, grilled it, crock pot i mean anything you could think of and there's no way the only way it will not be good is if you overcook it. yeah so I mean, that's top notch all in, the, dude. in the bird spectrum i would i would skip a steak for sandhill cranes i mean we argue over it like when we that guide hunt we went on we we're like I was, you know we had some birds and you know we're like hey man can i get one of them and oh no fuck no you know that's my birds. I mean, we got three birds each. We shot a we shot a four man limit on that guy. So what is the Every, limit on crane? Per it's person? three three apiece. Three per person. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we shot them birds, and man, we were like literally like nobody would give you anything. You know, <laughs> you got your, you know, six breast, and that's like prize possession. That's so how good they are. The the reason I mean I would think you hunt bigger groups is you put a lot of work in setting out the spread you know getting everything right you don't want to just hunt a small group because you only get you know three birds a person you want to hunt I, I'm assuming as big of a group as you can yeah um I, 
my favorite groups are probably about eight. I like a good group of eight because, you know, you get in where if you have two groups together and one, one group, mess, you know, two different groups and one group messes it up, I really hate, like, it kind of, I get a little nervous because, you know, then I have to explain to this group what they did wrong or, you know, tell this group sorry because this group screwed it up. So I really like a group of six to eight that, like, you know, is all in the same party. And that gives you enough shooting because, man, them, them birds are – if you can kill an eight-man, I mean, it's a it's a pile of birds. That, that does sound like a pile. So how big of an operation are y'all running? I mean, do y'all stay pretty booked up with y'all's, uh, I mean, pretty much hunting every day type of thing during duck season? Man, so my boss at Row Outfitters, he, uh, he is – he's always – I mean, we're always working pretty much like seven days a week. You know, if we're there, we're working. And uh, last year, didn't get much time off, you know. We just hunted all day. I mean, he's got a giant operation, multiple different ranches. We're, we do anything you can think of, elk, deer, all dad, turkeys, I mean, mule deer, whatever you want, we do it. And uh, it's a so, yeah, it's a really big operation. And there's a lot of people that, you know, you tell people, oh, I'm a, I'm a waterfowl guide or a, I guide crane. They don't understand all the work you put in behind the scenes. I mean, I've got several buddies that uh, guide waterfowl on the coast, and they're working out there, you know, a month or two before season. You go out there, brush blinds, go out there. they got to get all the conditions right, you know, for the season. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Man, it's a, it's a ton. I mean, I love it, and all my buddies back home, you know, they got, like, big boy jobs, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> uh, I guess I really don't, but uh, I'm just – trying to live this little dream out real quick. Right. You living know? life to the fullest is what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we work pretty good. I mean, I'm not just a waterfowl guy. I do I do deer, pigs, whatever you want. But when the birds are in season, I'm, yeah. I'm a bird guy. Well, what do you do in the off season? Man, I'm actually going to – I'm trying to start a bow fishing uh, business okay. back home. I mean, everybody does it. But I got a lot of, guy, you know, guys who hunt, hunted with me last year and everything, and – they, as soon as I say Louisiana, they talk about redfish. I said, you know, catching a redfish is fun, but have you ever shot them? And they're like, man, I want to do it. How much? And I'm like, man, you know, back home it's two fifty a person, which, you know, you put six people in a boat, you know, $1,500. So, I mean, so they make a money. pretty good living doing that. So yeah. I'm hoping to do that. But, yeah, man, the uh, back to the waterfowl, like the thing I wanted to say was, like, a lot of people think, like, you know, it's easy, it's fun. It's, it is. It's great. But, man, I bought a new GMC last year. Bought it with 24 miles on it, two days before Christmas. I got like 31,000 miles on it right now. Just from mainly Just from scouting. Crane and hunting, dude. Like, I mean, I did do a lot of turkey hunting. We hunted all over this year. We shot uh, 44 birds, had 24 misses. I mean, we got on some turkeys, but... So, that had a little bit to do with it, but man, the crane hunting, I was just putting so much, you know so many miles on my truck last year was a little rough so we were driving a lot more than i guess we would normally but yeah that's one thing like you're you know you're putting your you buy a new truck be ready to you know you blow i blew three tires out in one day last year Man. and then i switched to get i finally got some mud tires you know something that could handle a little bit more than my stock tires could but i had three blowouts in one day and it was so cold i was wearing a fanatic sitka suit like my deer hunting shit in my truck when the first tire blew out dude I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm on the side of the road. It's like 20 degrees plus wind chill. The wind's blowing 60 miles an hour all the time up there. I mean, dude, I was just livid. I mean, I couldn't barely do So I put this tire on, and I was a back right, and I drive to the shop, get it fixed. Guys over there, I mean, they fix it like that. I didn't even have to. I just dropped, gave them the tire. They're like, just stay here, fix it for me. Go out and blow another tire out. Just scouting cranes. I'll be damned. So one of the things we talked about yesterday was we got to talking about your dog. And so those cranes are pretty aggressive birds from what we were talking about. So what are some of the precautions you take with your dog as far as, you know, sending them for cranes? What kind of gear you put your dog in for the retrieves? So I just, my dog, he uh, he's not a real big dog. So he learned really quick that he's got to body those cranes up. So I got a video on my phone of his first crane and, it's in the decoys, and I, I really should have walked. I would, now I'd walk out and grab the crane, but I was like, I want to see what he can do, what he's going to do before I send him on a bird that's 500 yards out there. Because, I mean, they, their claws are bad. They're 
beaks, you know, can hurt a dog. I mean, he's got he gets cut up a little bit, but so I sent him on this bird, and at first he runs up to it, and when it bowed up, he didn't know what to do. He just kind of sat back, and I mean, he's that dude. I watched him at a year old retrieving geese. I mean, triples, big honkers in Kansas. Ice, never been on ice before. He's breaking through ice, climbing up on the ice, getting like he's not scared of anything. He doesn't. He's not a dog that freaks out in a bind, you know. So when he runs up to this crane, it bows up, and he just kind of looked at it, and then he went to it, and he, you know, pecked at him, and he kind of sat back again, and then he made a circle. I got the video, man. It's he made a circle, and he comes back and just plows his crane over. So he learned pretty quick. That's what he had to do with those birds. But yeah, uh, the gear. So he wears goggles. That's it. Uh, I see a lot of guys they don't run them on their dogs, uh, man. Even with the goggles, I'm still worried. I have another picture of a crane's claws grabbing the goggles. I mean, not on purpose, obviously, but he's fighting my dog, and he rips the goggles off. And as I'm, I'm, get, I'm down on the ground trying to get this good angle of this bird and my dog fighting, and uh, I notice the goggles lift up. So I run out there, and I just push my dog off and grab I mean, I was right there. I was just trying to get a picture. Right, right. And, uh, man, that crane – lifted those goggles off my dog and i mean could have extremely <laughs> hurt him you know sounds you know. like you almost need a, a hog dog for those dinosaurs <laughs> you do man i mean they are and he's not a big dog he's 60 pounds during hunting season i mean he's a small dog you know 64 65 pounds right now he's about 78 but he's he's sick so he's a he's a vet man he just you can take i take him out i work him every day but he doesn't need the uh you know the stuff like a young puppy would have i also have a i think she's nine ten weeks old right now i also got another lab and she is gonna be a beast she's gonna be better than my dog i have now hate to say it he's great i get offered by some customers a lot of money for him and it just kind of makes you mad sometimes you're like hey man my dog's out there working and you're gonna offer me some money for him I don't like that, but also it is pretty it's kind of a compliment cool. at yeah. the same time it you know is. saying you got a badass dog you yeah. know it is pretty cool, but this female I have, she's gonna be a beast, man. She uh, she's gonna be badass. But, but anyway, so we are at the expo this weekend. We've met a lot of cool people, and Rick here was telling me he's thinking about booking a hunt. What is it in South Africa? Yeah, man, South Africa. I want to go out there pretty bad. What, what's your plan for that, man? So me and uh, another boy, guys with me, uh, my buddy Sean. He uh. We've been talking about doing a hunt, and I got a bunch of land in Kansas. Well, this year we didn't put in for our tag, being complete dumbasses. I mean, this land is proven. You know, my dad goes out there three years. He shot a 187-inch 9, shot a 160-something-inch 10, and then he shot a deer that he shouldn't have shot, and he said it too. He was pretty pissed at himself when he did, but it was a high 150, close to 163-year-old. And uh, so we were supposed to put in for that and do that, and we didn't. So then we start talking. We're like, man, what do we want? To, like, we need to go on a hunt, but I don't want to shoot a deer. I don't want to shoot a mule deer. I mean, maybe like an elk or something, but I was like, let's go to Africa. So we get to walking around over here, man, and the people we met, they helped us out. We got numbers, you know, talking about what dates are the best and what we need to shoot, and some people won't let you shoot bows, and some people will. I mean, so we're just trying to figure that out, but, man, I'm so excited. I'm I'll be booking in November. Definitely sure. be a hunt of a lifetime. Oh, man. Well, you know there's duck hunting in South Africa, really good duck hunting. Dude, I saw him it's holding hard to up get two into, birds, like two swans or something yeah. on a picture. I don't yeah. know. This guy, Ramsey Russell, is duck hunting there right now, killing these really cool geese and yeah. these, these little cool little ducks. And badass. They got, a, they got a mallard-like duck there. It's in the same family and everything. But I, it's a, probably a whole. It's probably an ordeal to, to go there and do both big game and duck yeah. hunting. you got to really pick, pick which one you want to do. Man, if I could go to Africa and duck hunt and bring my dog, I'd do it. <laughs> that would be a trip for sure. Maybe have, like, a lion chasing my dog in the back or something. Hell, yeah. yeah. So, man, uh, we're about out of time. So why don't you tell us the location of your guide service, the name of your guide service, and how they can book with you all. So it's uh, Row Outfitters, R-O-E-W-E. Uh, we're in Haskell, Texas. We hunt all over Texas. We got ranches everywhere if you want to shoot big deer, you know, everywhere in Texas. We got ranches in Oklahoma and New Mexico for elk. And uh, mule deer, and uh, but yeah, that's that's it. Hell yeah, man! Well, I appreciate you coming on today. It was good meeting you. I want to link up with you and do a hunt here this season or next season. Maybe we can get something worked out. Come up, do a crane hunt. I want to shoot some fucking cranes, dude. I 
I oh, yeah, see man. videos all the time, and I, I really something I've wanted to do for a while. So, hell yeah, cool deal. Well, thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, man. Pleasure. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, man.